It's so great to have you here on the Clark Howard Show. You know, our mission is all about serving you with advice and information that empowers you so you make better financial decisions in your life. And in this new year, there's a resolution that has a name that I was not familiar with, but is something I've talked about for a good while, is a way for you to take more control of your spending. And think about how common with New Year's resolutions they are about getting spending under control. I want to explain to you something I've talked about for a long time, and now it has a catchy term for it. And if you're already thinking about last year's tax return, you have to do sometime here in 24, and if you're an early filer because you're getting a refund, there's something I want you to know about that is a new pilot program that's available in about a quarter of the nation's states this year as part of a pilot. So I've talked about the no stores, no online in the past, but I never had a fun term for it. And now there's a catchphrase for it called financial fasting. And when I have done in the past, um, in my TV work, when I've done stuff with couples who have uh, spending issues that are tearing at the fabric of the marriage, one of my key recipes or prescriptions or whatever you'd call it has been getting people out of stores and getting people off shopping online. And the reason is that I want you to think about this. From the beginning of the Christmas shopping season in October, all the way through this week in January, people are in stores and online shopping a lot more than normal. And what happens is not just the buying you do for other people happens, but because of all the things you're seeing in the stores and online, you buy yourself a lot more items than you would otherwise. You spend a lot more money because you're in shopping mode. Well, I find that what now, and I like this term, financial fasting, that when you ban yourself from shopping, uh, either for a week at a time or certain days of the week, you say, hey, this is a no shopping Tuesday or this is no shopping uh, Friday or whatever it is, that you eliminate the opportunity to spend money. You know, when I've met with couples that are deeply in debt, I put them on a financial diet where they only go to the grocery store every other week and other stores every sixth week. And when I say stores, I mean online, in person. That the idea is that you break the shopping habit. Now, many of us don't have an extreme spending problem, but we have a problem where there seems to be more month than money. And so we're always a little stretched. And so reducing the opportunity to shop is really, really important. You know, and it's easier than that dreaded word budget. My experience has been that most people who go by a budget are people who are already good with money and it's part of their road mapping to how they handle money. If you have a thing where you just don't know where all your money goes, then doing something where you ban yourself from shopping X number of days a week or a week a month or something like that, you'll be stunned how much less money you'll spend. And I want you to dial back to four years ago when we were in the early phase of the pandemic in 20 and economists just were beyond, their minds were blown because People were marooned at home in a lot of the country 
for a pretty long period of time in 20, and their spending collapsed. I mean, flat out collapsed. That I don't think any of us realized how much of what we spend on a daily or weekly basis is discretionary unless you're just getting by on the absolute basics of life based on income and family size. For most of us, it really is a lot of things that we just are in a pattern of we buy this, do that, do the other. And before you know it, we've spent real money. So consider this, whatever you call it, and whatever way you implement it in your life, if you like the new term financial fasting, do it. Whatever it is, think about restricting the days or weeks you shop and not going, oh, there was this great deal I got at blah, blah, blah. Don't run online and place an order for it. You know, you give yourself time and it changes behavior. You know, something else I've talked about a lot in 22 and 23, first time I've mentioned it in 24, is pay in four. The patterns show that through the Christmas shopping season, pay in four was extremely popular with shoppers, where you, in four easy payments, you pay for something that you don't feel you can afford when you're in the store. And then the reports are going to come out in the next month or two about how much trouble people have gotten into with paying for, and they're ruining their credit, they're defaulting, they're getting hit with penalties, all that. And so that is another example of impulse, where the paying for got people spending more money over the last couple of months than their budgets actually, their wallet could actually afford. And so that's the opposite land of what I'm talking about, which is eliminating that impulse at least part of every week or part of every month. Was that enough, Daddy Clark, Krista? I like it. I love the idea of, of doing this. I think I'm going to try it myself. So would you financially fast uh, certain days of the week or would you prefer a week, a month or something like that? I think a month is good. A week, a month? No, one whole month. You think you could actually go a month without spending any money in stores online or in person? I mean, I think a lot of people do it that I've known. Like a known, I, I, I like the idea of doing like a net nothing. So maybe I sell some things online and I use that for discretionary spending, like on eating out or something, say. But I would buy, you know, groceries to make food, things like that. But like beyond that, yeah, no extra clothing or... Things like that. And I want to emphasize again, if you are in significant, deep financial difficulty, remember, you buy groceries only every two weeks. You only go to shop online or in a store every six weeks. And that will change the spending patterns that you live by in your life. Okay, we'll go to questions. This first one's from Justin in Arizona. I am a second generation follower and have incorporated your suggestions in my life to become financially independent. My wife and I self manage four single home rental units. Wow. All of these homes were formerly owner occupied by us, but every time we moved to a new home, we were able to re retain the previous property and convert to a long term rental. Three of the units have been refinanced and converted into investment type mortgages. However, one still carries the original owner-occupied mortgage. None of them are currently held under an LLC. We would like to create an individual LLC, individual LLCs for each property to limit our exposure, but we're worried that this action may trigger a mortgage refinance with a significantly higher interest rate. Right. Do you recommend establishing LLCs for these rentals regardless of the outcome to limit our exposure or leave them as is and rely on an umbrella policy to mitigate our risk? Justin, I would say, first of all, congratulations that every time you moved, you created another investment in your life. Awesome. I love that. So the lenders likely are not going to permit you to maintain those mortgages. The conversion to an LLC, they will trigger, uh, at a normal lender, they'll trigger the due on sale clause as if it's been sold and will not allow you to maintain. You don't want to go through the extreme hassle and expense and likely higher interest rate 
refining any of these in order to have the individual properties and LLCs. Rather, your final thing you said about having a large umbrella liability policy in your life would be really important for you to do. You are doing it. That would be the next best thing. As you roll off and have paid off a mortgage on each of these properties over time, then you migrate the property into its own LLC, reducing the risks to your overall asset base that you have worked so hard to build up. And at the time that you have that property uncovered, in other words, no debt against it, the risks are even higher that you face. And that's why having that property in your own LLC will be very important. And in most uh, major markets, like in Phoenix and Tucson, you're going to find lawyers who specialize in single-issue real estate LLCs, where they are Ensure, where they're doing the LLC for one particular real estate holding. These are done standard by these people who specialize in them. They're cheap to do, and they know exactly what they're doing because they do them for real estate investors commonly. And you'll find lawyers who do this through one of the real estate investor clubs that are available throughout the Phoenix, Mesa metro area and also in the Tucson area. Joe in Oregon says, I would like Clark's opinion on using Hopper to book a flight. Hopper is really good. Hopper is a very good search engine. There's always some level of risk when you book your reservation through any third party. Hopper is an excellent tool for finding the lowest fare. And uh, there are people who use Hopper as a search tool, find a fare, and then they go book it direct, uh, but that's defeating for Hopper what their, what their reason for being is. But I recommend that if you're good at searching for fares, you search fares on Hopper and on Google Flights, google.com slash flights, that because they use different mathematical models to tell you whether a fare is a good deal or not, and one may find a deal, the other doesn't. Looking at both of those is very useful for you. Remember, Southwest does not show up on search tools like Hopper or Google Flights. You have to search Southwest fares separately, and they are the largest airline for domestic flights in the United States by a pretty good distance from the others. Kim in North Carolina says, I just found out my beloved Samsung Galaxy S8 has not been receiving security updates since April 1st, 2021. Oh. Ironic date, no? April Fool's Day on you. <laughs> I love this phone and don't need a new one. I hate creating waste and replacing things that I that don't need it. I use two-factor authentication, remove banking and investing apps, and use Google Wallet. Is it safe to continue to use? I'm a listener since my 20s, retired at 44, and I'm now 55. My secret, listen to Clark, start investing in the early 20s, and live below your means. Well, I'm going to put that in the opposite order. I'm going to say, live below your means, start investing in your 20s. And it was. I'm glad you listened to me from a young age. Retired at 44. Unreal. Now the double nickel. So retirement has suited you. 11 years of retirement starting at age 44. Isn't that great? Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Because of habits like this. And Kim, it doesn't matter if you choose to work now or not. The fact is any work you do would be work that would be fun for you. And that's what's great when you don't have to say, I owe, I owe, I owe. So off to work, I go. Anything you do now, volunteer work, fun, uh, work of whatever kind you're doing because you want to, that's the best. Okay. So having said all that, Using a phone that, uh, that there's no security updates for the last three years, based on what uh, people in tech security say, that is a significant risk. Same with you know, the story that came out about school districts having to get rid of Chromebooks because Google didn't support security on them for a decent amount of time. And so they have all these surplus computers that are now e-waste. Um, you're, you're doing a lot of things 
to continue using a phone that will obviously have, has uh, security vulnerabilities on it, but you're not using any of your banking apps, investing apps. You have the risk with your email that is on your phone and the vulnerabilities that might expose. Um, you've done enough things that as a non-tech person, I feel comfortable about what you're doing. And I know I'm going to hear clear information from people <laughs> in tech security that I'm an idiot. And Kim, you've been retired for 11 years. They would say, spend the money, get a new phone. So I mean, I'm already doing the rebuttal at the same time. I'm saying, don't worry, be happy. I think you're fine. What would you say? I would say you're fine. I wouldn't worry. Okay. Well, I I'm mean, glad you said it. Without the too. banking apps or so anything like that. So somebody can say that you stink, I stink and I stink. Oh, yeah. That we both stink. Pile on. Yeah. All right. Coming up ahead, we're going to talk about something that does stink. Paying taxes and having to pay to prepare the taxes that you're paying. There's a new pilot program that may eliminate at least the paying part for preparing your taxes. I'm going to tell you about it. I've been obsessed for years that we are the only country that I know of in the developed world that has this paperwork heavy, even if it's electronic, difficult process for filing our income taxes with our federal government. And uh, pretty much everywhere else in the country, in, in, the, in the developed world, not our country, uh, income taxes are automatically figured. Now, in the United States, we're in a cycle of a great deal of distrust in institutions of all kinds, including especially government in the United States. And so there's a lot of reluctance on people's part to use what's known as direct file. And it is available in a pilot this year in the United States and is completely optional. If you're not freaked out that the IRS would compute your tax return for you, then you can do direct file under certain circumstances. And for this year, you can only do it in 13 states and only for certain taxpayers. So if you own your own business, you're not doing this. This is for people who get a W-2 from a place of work, or they get Social Security. Um, UI is okay if you were unemployed part of 23, you can do it. And if you earn a, a small amount of interest each year on savings accounts, you can do it. And that's all the people that can do it this year in the state's that are in the program. And so the, the states are Alaska, California, Florida, New Hampshire, uh, Nevada, Massachusetts, South Dakota, Tennessee, Texas, Wyoming, and did I say Arizona? Are the ones that you can do this. Um, if you have a simple streamlined return. And it's all part of just testing the waters for what in our country is being called direct file. But again, this is how taxes are done pretty much everywhere else in high income countries other than the United States. There is not all this collecting of stacks of paperwork and going to an accountant who does tax or uh, using tax prep software. It's a, it's the, there is no real hassle for most taxpayers in other countries having to file income tax. And it's a unique, weird thing we do in the United States. And as, as an individual know that we are forever from this being how everybody has to do taxes in the United States because of our independent streak that so many of us have in the U.S. and distrust of government that so many people have in the United States. This will 
for a long, long time remain maybe forever a voluntary thing. But in my belief, it will become common that many people will want to do taxes, direct file, and eliminate the current hassles involved with and fees involved with filing taxes each year. Okay, this first question is from Gonzalo in California. About four and a half years ago, my wife and I bought a second home for our college kids. My youngest will be done soon, and we were wondering if it's best to sell. If so, we would have to pay, would we have to pay capital gains? It's worth about $220,000 more now than what we paid for it. I thought about paying off our main house, but today I heard you say it's better to keep that money in the bank since we could get about 5% plus in interest versus 2.75% interest on our main home's mortgage. Also considering renting out to family versus college kids. I'm a big fan of yours. I listen to you every morning on my way to work. You truly do have people's best interest in mind. Well, Gonzalo, thank you so much for that. And this is uh, what you did is something that has become very, very normal and routine in college towns where someone will buy a home for their kids to live in at college, have other college students rent along with them. So your kids end up getting basically free or heavily reduced rate housing. And in your case, in four years, you've had a a very large run up in the value of that property. So, yes, you would pay capital gains because it was not a principal residence. And depending on your overall income, you would be paying a tax rate that would just reflect simply based on that income. But you'd have, if your net gain is over $200,000, you would be paying tax on that, often at a rate that caps out at about 26%. But for many taxpayers, will be a fair amount less than that. So should you keep the property? You know, if, if it's not a hassle managing it from where you live versus where the property is, renting it out in a college town, that's been a really solid market for people. Your idea of renting maybe to a professor or an administrator at the college versus college students I like that a lot because I can tell you uh, rental properties in college towns get beaten to death. I mean, I don't know what college students do in these rentals. If they run around with sledgehammers and uh, and saws and, and rip things up and put holes in things and uh, stain things and all that. So if you were to keep it, I think your idea of renting to a traditional kind of renter instead of college students might not earn you as much revenue every month, but would come with a whole lot less hassle and the place would be better kept up. So I would say that you, since you already have embedded capital gains, you could do a test ride renting it out for a year or two if you're like, this is no fun at all, we hate it then go ahead and sell it and pay the tax. Remember, it's great to have the gain. That's why you would owe tax, because you have the gain. And you're making exactly the right decision on your principal residence, keeping that mortgage in place at 2.75%. That is the equivalent of holding an investment and money that you're paying such a below market interest rate. And I love that. Karen, Wisconsin says, I'm in Ireland currently, and when preparing for this trip to visit friends for nearly two weeks, I very intentionally packed no more than would fit in my carry-on. I'm pretty proud that I broke your rule and was able to bring three pairs of shoes and still have plenty of room to spare. Well, because I purchased an economy ticket and had an aisle seat, I couldn't get to I didn't get to board until the overhead space was already full, and after all of my efforts and intentionality, still had to part with my bag for the international leg of my trip. Is there anything I can do to prevent this in the future besides paying for a more expensive flight to board sooner? Or could I shove my small purse in the suitcase and insist that because it's my only bag, I need it with me because of important medications, valuables, etc.? What are my rights? I want to know before if I'm being a Karen, if being a Karen will get me anywhere in this situation. I do not like parting with my belongings. I hate it when they take my bag away at the boarding door. I hate it because you don't know if your bag's going to be at the other end with you. 
and then you got to wait at that stupid thing called a baggage carousel and watch it go round and round and round while the flight took you to Europe, to Ireland at 600 miles an hour, the bag travels at one quarter of a mile an hour from the plane to the baggage carousel. I'm with you. I'm feeling anxious just talking about this. <laughs> so plain fact of the matter, when you fly a full fare airline, if you don't have status on that airline, you're in the penalty box and you face a great risk that your bag is going to be taken from you. You have to psychologically just accept it and prepare for it and get all your uh, meds you might have, electronics, anything like that, in a little backpack, knowing that uh, your bag may not make the trip and meet you at the other end. Yeah, because pleading with them may not work. <laughs> pleading with thinking, them. You know, they may say, well, here's a baggie you can put all your stuff yeah, in. Yeah, it's not... <laughs> That's not going to help. I mean, you could try, but yeah. All right, we'll go on to Sylvia's question. But I hope you're having a lot of fun in yes. Ireland, by the way. Love Ireland. Sylvia in Georgia says, what do I need to look for in a warranty for my car? What features and costs? Rule number one, decide if you actually need an extended warranty on the vehicle you're buying. Go subscribe temporarily, uh, one-time use to Consumer Reports, read Consumer Reports through your library, have a Consumer Reports subscription and look at the vehicle reliability for your make and model. And if the car you have shows in Consumer Reports to be extremely reliable, then take your chances. Don't spend the thousands of dollars on an extended warranty on the car. On the other hand, if the car looks like it's one that you get to be on a first name basis with everybody at the repair shop that it's got a terrible predicted reliability. Then you want to look at buying one of these, but only buy the manufacturer's own. Not one the dealer tells you is so much better than the manufacturer's. No, you want only the manufacturer's own. These third party warranties have been a total and complete disaster for consumers. So if you have a Honda, you want a Honda branded warranty. Toyota, Toyota branded. GM, GM, Ford, on like that. You want the one from the company whose car you've got, or SUV or truck or whatever you have. That's the only one that you can buy and know that they're going to be around and that you have a good shot of getting the repairs paid for. Um, by the way, the price on the manufacturer warranties are negotiable, and you can call multiple branded dealers for your brand and see who will sell you the identical manufacturer's warranty for the best price. You do not have to pay suggested retail for these. And... I hope you have an absolutely great day. Tomorrow, you know what excitement we have? It's time for Clark Stinks. You get to hear where I missed the ball. I gave bad advice. I only gave part of the story. All of that on tomorrow's edition of our podcast. And what we're about, you saving more, spending less, and avoid getting ripped off. Have a great day.